Morning, everyone. Morning. If you would, please remain standing as we recite 2 Chronicles 7 14. And my people who are <coughs> called by my name, humble themselves, pray and seek my face, and turn from their evil ways. Then I will hear from the heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. Thank you all. Now we'll do the pledge to the Bible. I pledge allegiance to the Bible. God's holy word. I will make it a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And I will hide its words in my heart that I might not sin against God. Thank you all. Pledge to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty justice for all. Finally, the pledge to the Christian flag. I pledge allegiance to the Christian flag and to the Savior for whose kingdom it stands, one Savior, crucified, risen, and coming again with life and liberty to all who believe. Thank you all. You may be seated. Ms. Missy, if you would, at least in a prayer for our country, for all of our churches, for our leaders and for God's chosen people. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for today. Another week we have gotten through. Amen. Amen. Today we're going to continue in the uh, table talk series of the chain of discipleship. And just to recap, we have learned about humility. It takes humility to be a Christian. We've learned about hollow Christians, about people that say that they're Christians, but don't act like they're Christians. We have learned to count the cost of discipleship. Now, to count the cost of discipleship is not to make the decision if you're going to do it or if you're not going to do it. It is the decision of that you realize that it is coming down the path. We learned about being yourself, not conforming to society's idea of Christians, but to display your gifts and talents as God has uniquely gave them to you. We learned about the Holy Spirit equipping us, giving us all that we need through the power. And we've learned about action and reaction. What people do to us, we can't stop. We don't have control of, but how we react to those things, we do. <clears throat> and our actions, our reactions should display Christ. We learned about stewardship. There are two definitions of stewardship. The worldly definition of stewardship, which is do what's best for you. And Christ's version of or stewardship. Then we learned about Christ's values in our life. That we don't take control and set the mark for the value of our life. But God's Word teaches us the value of our life. And then we talked about the end game, eternity. About the choices that we make today and how that affects our eternity. And today, we're going to look at Know Your Role. This is a warning for, our, for every disciple of Jesus Christ. Luke chapter 17, verses 1 through 10 is where we'll be. This week and next week, this will be the do's and don'ts of appreciation. And I need you to hang tough with me as we go through this. Three points of know your role. First point is offenses. Reading verses 1 and 2. And he said to the disciples, Offenses will certainly come, but woe to the one they come through. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea than for him to cause one of these little ones to stumble. A couple of things I want to get clear here. The first thing is, is that offenses will come in life. They just will 
You will be offended or you will offend someone. It's just the human nature of things. But woe to those that they come through. You see, we have a duty as a disciple in Jesus Christ. And that is to keep the unity of the family. So let's say you were offended by someone. Then your job as a disciple is to go to that person and get things right in a loving, Christ-like manner. If you're the one that's causing the offense, Jesus has a special warning for us that do that. That warning is, it is better for you to tie a big rock around your neck and jump into the water than to offend one of these little ones, to stumble one of these little ones. Now here, Christ is talking about babes in Christ. He's not talking about little children. Although we know how Christ felt about the children. Suffer the children that come unto me. Here he's talking about new Christians. Babes in Christ. You see, they need care. Just like babes do. They need guidance. They need help in growth. So that they can grow and become a strong disciple for Jesus Christ. When a strong disciple offends one of these folks and chooses not to get things right, they may stop that little baby Christian from growing. May turn away from growing. That is where Jesus is warning us. As a disciple in Jesus Christ, when it comes to the unity of the church, love thy neighbor as thyself. It is imperative in rule one that we need to support and grow the unity of the church and not destroy it. I've talked to folks, members that have an abrasive personality. And if you think on it, you probably can think of someone. It doesn't matter. They just seem to rub you the wrong way. And I've talked with them about their abrasive Personality and their answers is usually, well, it's the truth. Well, it's how I feel. You have a responsibility as a mature Christian, disciple in Christ, to do things the right way. Maybe the truth, but you can think of a way to tell that truth that is accepting to that baby in Christ. Maybe the way you feel, but you can think of a way to be unified and edify the body in a way that would help that person grow. Amen. So you have a responsibility to keep the unity of the church. It says the same thing in Matthew 18, 7. Jesus is reminding us in a second place in Scripture. So this is hugely important. Know your role in the family of Christ. And that's to be an encourager, not a discourager. That's to be the edifying the body or building up the body, not a destroyer of the body. Offenses are unavoidable in life. However, divine judgment always waits the person that causes a disciple or a little one of Christ to stumble. Our existence as a disciple is to encourage or build up the body, not destroy it. Your actions as a disciple have consequences. Not only does it have consequences in this life, it has consequences with your master in eternity as well. Also, if you go on and read it, we talk about teaching of God's Word. That's hugely important. When you're discipling someone, or you're head of a Sunday school class, or you're up here preaching, whatever it may be, or you're just witnessing to someone, you have an obligation to make sure you're just teaching God's Word. We're not slanting it to go with our viewpoint. We're just laying out God's Word. James 3.1 says, Not many should become teachers, my brother. Knowing that we will receive a stricter judgment. You need to make sure you represent Christ 
in his word. Now, two seconds ago, I said our existence as a disciple is to encourage and build up the body. This is true. But another fallacy I want to make sure that we understand is that discipline and correction are part of encouraging and building the body. No one has a child in, in their family that is not willing to give that child direction of the right way to go. And it's the same in the church. When you have a baby in Christ in the church, you must give it correct direction to go. You must correct them and discipline them if necessary. Now, I hope this statement I just said destroys the fall fallacy of teddy bear theology. You're okay, I'm okay, because God loves us all. It's got a little hint of Mr. Rogers to it, doesn't it? But that's not the master we serve. The master we serve expects his disciples to stand for and correctly teach the word and correct when necessary. Now, with that said, we don't need to nitpick or point out every little sin. That's the Holy Spirit's job to correct. We only need to step in when it is necessary. And when we do, there's two things that you ought to know before you go to someone and, and talk to them. First of all, you need to check your attitude. Are you doing what you're about to do out of love for that person? Do you love that person enough to correct that person in God's way? Or are you doing it because you want your pound of flesh and you're upset? And the second thing is, you have to go with the will to immediately forgive that person if repentance is present. Over and over and over again. We're going to see that in verses 3 and 4. Be on your guard. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in a day and comes back to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive him. It is the attitude of Christ. If true repentance is there, if it's truly a mistake, even if he's done it or she's done it seven times that day, our job as a disciple in Christ is to unify and equip and build the body. We don't get the luxury of holding out because it makes us feel good. We don't get the luxury of holding forgiveness from this person or treating this person like a, a brother or sister in Christ just because we're not done being upset with them. A true disciple in Christ understands that they have a master. And that master says this, if they offend you seven times and there is an air of repentance, you must forgive immediately. Brothers and sisters should always be ready to forgive offenses when repentance is present. Rebuke of a disciple should always be for the purpose of repentance. The attitude, attitude you show should be of Christ. Forgiveness where repentance is present should be quick and full, just as the rebuke. Let me explain what I mean. As pastor of the church, we have someone that, that is in our ministry and they fall. It comes to the church's attention that they fall. And since the church that represents Christ is in danger of its integrity or reputation, as pastor, I, I believe that we immediately go to that person and we talk to that person about what they do. If that person understands what they've done wrong and they're taking time to get things right, I immediately remove them from the ministry so that they can focus and concentrate on their walk. 
But the moment they come to me with total repentance and tell me that they have got it right with God, immediately they must be restored. I've had this discussion with pastors in training quite a bit. You see, when we are willing to rebuke immediately and not restore immediately, we, we are damaging that Christian's walk. It is not at our luxury to forgive. It is under a command to do it immediately. That's tough to do sometimes, especially if the offense comes to you. Over the years, on social media, I've been called a few things. I've had my reputation slander. And it makes you upset if you let it. But the only way as a disciple of Christ that I can serve as pastor or serve even as a disciple is to remain in Christ by saying it's under the blood. It is. The moment the offense occurs, I have to say it's under the blood. Because God is in control. Amen. He is the master and I am the disciple. And my heart, my walk, must remain clean if I'm going to serve my God. The moment I allow self to take any sort of advantage in the situation is the moment I stumble and I fall. So when that person comes to you and says, you know what, I was mad, I'm sorry, or you please forgive me, and what I did was wrong, I always tell them it was forgiven the moment I seen it because it's under the blood. But thank you. Ephesians 4.32 says, and says, and be kind and compassionate to one another. Forgive one another, just as God also forgave you in Christ. Be kind. Be compassionate. Be a disciple of Jesus Christ in the moment when the human nature itself wants to take over. That's a tough first point, ain't it, for us? If we're honest with ourselves, that's a hard one to get over. But it's not a request. It's a command from your master. So find a way to trigger your mind so that you can do it. The second point is, is the power to succeed. We're about to see that, verses 5 and 6. The apostle said to the Lord, increase our faith. If you have the faith of a mustard seed, the Lord said, you can see, or you can say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it will obey you. It's not the amount of faith that you have. It's the genuineness of that faith. If you truly have a heart that wants to serve your God, it doesn't take a mountain of faith. It takes a mustard seed. Rely on faith, genuine faith, you can get through anything. Genuine faith is powerful, even in small quantities. The disciples were listening to what uh, Jesus was telling them here, and they're saying, well, if that's what it takes, increase our faith. It's almost like they're saying, make it easier for us. <laughs> Give us more faith. And then Jesus says, you need to learn a lesson about faith. And maybe we all need to learn a lesson about faith. A mustard seed. Has everybody seen a mustard seed? I keep this in my pocket, you probably can't see it. But the mustard seed's in the middle. It's that little dark circle. That's a mustard seed of faith. That mustard seed of faith can take a mulberry tree. And you must understand that a mulberry tree's deep root system that intertwines into the ground and holds in like toenails, it is almost di very difficult to get out of the ground. So Jesus is saying, if you take that amount of faith and you command that mulberry tree with that kind of root system to uproot itself and be planted in the seed, it will do it. So he's telling the disciples, 
that you don't need a semi-truck load of faith. You just need genuine faith. Genuine faith comes from a heart that is willing to serve their master. Genuine faith will make you do things that you don't want to do. Yeah. It'll help you forgive someone that you don't want to forgive. Yeah. It'll help you get over offenses that you're really not willing or want to get over through yourself. Genuine faith will keep self in check enough so that you can be the disciple that God wants you to be. This is a valid description of faith, or a vivid description of faith. It is the dependence on God and a willingness to do His will without validation. Y'all get that? You need me to say it again? All right. It is the dependence upon God and a willingness to do His will without validation. Hebrews 11, 1. Says, Faith is the substance of things hoped for, but the evidence of things not yet seen. If you need validation to serve your God, then you have absolutely no faith. Faith is the engine that runs the disciple. I would come up with a saying that I, I really like. I said, I believe. People say, I'll believe it when I see it. And I'd like to say, I believe it, then I'll see it. It's just the opposite of what the world says. Thomas needed proof. He needed validation before he would serve. He needed to stick his hands into Jesus' side and in his fingers. Validation. From that point forward, he's always been known as Doubting Thomas. I don't need that kind of validation to serve my God. You know why? Because the validation's in here. I know who I was and how I thought. And now I know who I am and how I think. Serving God means that we serve by faith. That brings us to our third point. Remember who you are and know your role. Now, I'm about to go through 7 through 10, verses 7 through 10. This is not going to be popular to a lot of society. But I truly believe verses 7 through 10 is under attack. Before I start, let me say this so everybody can hear it. I truly respect our frontline defenders, the people in the hospitals that are fighting this disease, the police and the fire and the military and everybody that is doing what they're supposed to do, the frontline responders. They got my respect. I do. I respect them with all my heart. But this needs to be said. We do our duty as disciples in Christ and we should regard it as a privilege. Seven through ten. Which one of you having a slave tending sheep or plowing will say to him when he comes in from the field, come at once and sit down and eat? Instead, he will not tell him, prepare, or will he not tell him, prepare something for me to eat, get ready and serve me while I eat and drink, later you can eat and drink. Does he thank the slave because he did what was commanded? In the same way, when you have done all that you were commanded, you should say, we are good for nothing slaves, we only done our duty. When you're a disciple in Christ, attitude counts. When you allow self to get involved in your service to God, you will not serve God. It's just that simple. If God has commanded you to teach a class, and one person shows up to that class, and you won't want to do it because only one person showed up to that class, then you have allowed self to get involved. That one person is as valuable as a hundred to God. Amen. And so should your attitude. If you're doing a ministry that God's called you to and you're, 
you really could use some help. If there's no help around and no help comes, and you seem to have to do all the work, don't get sour. Praise God for giving you that responsibility. You know why? Because He knew you would do it. Don't wait for a pat on the back or a thank you. When you're a disciple in Christ, your life is about service. It's about sacrifice. It's about dying to self. It's about displaying Christ in everything you do. And there will be suffering along the way to do that. Don't look for a thank you. Do it as a duty. These thank you campaigns that are going on today, they don't really work. They don't promote the right kind of attitude. Let me explain what I'm saying to you. On Facebook, everybody's up thanking the truckers. I get it. All the places are shut down. There's no place to eat. I understand. And I appreciate what they do. But they're going around thanking the truckers, and all of a sudden somebody comes on Facebook and says, well, nobody thanks the railroaders. Railroaders bring the food to the truckers so they can take it. Without the railroaders, truckers wouldn't have nothing to truck. People get upset because they seem to get left out on these thank you campaigns. And then what happens is that we promote the wrong kind of life. A trucker is a trucker because he took the job to be a trucker. Amen. And he knows what it takes to be a trucker. A nurse is a nurse because they have found that calling and that's the job. And they know that they're going to have to face these things. They do it because of the heart for what they have. They're not doing it for the thank yous. People get upset because we don't thank everybody. You know, our garbage people are still out there collecting my trash, and I'm real thankful for them, or I'd have trash up across my roof. <laughs> Praise needed to do your job cripples your walk. When you need pointed out, when you need praise, when you need patted on the back to serve your God, you are not serving your God by faith. And third, it leads to ungrateful attitudes. People go to work, well, I don't ever get thanked. You know, I'm out here doing the exact same thing. I'm out here working with this virus and I don't hear anybody on Facebook thank me for it. Anytime that we have to promote self to do the jobs that we're called to do, we are ineffective at what we do. Now the reason I say this is because it is hugely important. If you're a disciple in Christ, I really need you to listen. It's hugely important. You're not going to get thanked for doing the ministry that you do. A lot. I've been doing ministry for 40 years. 30 years in some sort of leadership role. It's been a lot of few times that I've gotten yelled at, but I'm not thanked. I don't need to be thanked. I'm just doing my job. I'm a good-for-nothing slave doing their duty. And if we can remember to be humble that way, then you can serve God through anything. Any fire. Any hailstorm. Anything that's going on in your life will not be able to touch the faith that you have serving your God if you truly believe that you are just a slave doing their job. We see the slave who only did his job or what was commanded got no spe special con uh, commendation since all he done was to fulfill his responsibilities. A disciple of Christ should not expect special uh, commendations for doing what is required. And if you are, you really ought to check who you serve. I'm not striving to have my name put on the side of a building. I'm not striving to have my name put on the side of anything. I'm just serving my God till he calls me home. 
A disciple of Christ should not expect it. Why? We serve the Lord because this is what is expected of us to do when we follow Him. The moment you ask God to forgive you of our sins and you cashed in that free gift of salvation is the moment He became your master. It's the moment you became bought and paid for. It's the moment you start your life of embracing sacrifice, dying to self, and promoting the kingdom of God. At that moment in time, your job as a slave is to serve your master with the best abilities that you have, expecting nothing in return, and getting everything in the end. There's a quick list of duties. You can write these down if you want. I didn't have them put in the book. Of a disciple. Obedience. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 5. Respect. 1 Timothy 6 4. Patience. 1 Peter 2.18. Faithfulness, Colossians 3, 22. And a desire to please, Titus 2, 9. These duties are what is required. Did everybody get them? You need, them. You need some more time. First and last. First and last. Uh, obedience, Ephesians 6, 5. And the last one was desire to please, Titus chapter 2, verse 9. Service to your God should be number one in your life. The kingdom of God should be first priority and should be willing to be served by embracing sacrifice and dying to self. And doing the right thing according to what scripture says, not according to what society says. And expecting nothing in return. No thank you, no accolades. And then you get everything in return. When he says, well done, good and faithful servant. A couple of questions for you to close this out. Do you believe sometimes you, you deserve extra credit for serving God? Is there a time that maybe you're worn down mentally and the things that you're doing is not, not in the ministry is not coming to pass as you thought they would come to pass? And all of a sudden you think, you know what? If I didn't show up and do this, it wouldn't get done. How many ever run that through your head? I didn't show up to do this. Nobody else would do it. Who else is going to do it? When those kind of thoughts run through your head, there is a danger of self becoming more important than the ministry. Keep that in mind. God's ministry is a ministry of the next person up. God moves people around to other churches, to other ministries. He takes them home. They serve in other capacities. But you know what? God always fills the ministry. Obedience is not for extra credit. It's our job. Thank you. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, or if you're watching this by the uh, video, if you desire that free gift of salvation, all you have to do is say this prayer. You don't have to say it out loud, but you do have to mean it. Lord, forgive me of my sins. I'm lost and I need you in my life. Replace my will with yours, and I will follow you for an eternity. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. With every head bowed and every eye closed. If you said that prayer through our video ministry, welcome to the family of God. 
We encourage you to come here to Shine Light Baptist Church. The address is on the screen. When you feel uh, good enough to do it, and tell us about that decision so we can help you start your path as a disciple. Maybe you have a home church, or you have a church you're comfortable with. Then we encourage you to go to that pastor and tell them about the choice that you made when you feel comfortable returning to churches. And tell them that, uh, tell them of your decision so they can start you on your path. If you're here today and you said that prayer, I just need you to look up at me and I'll ask you three questions. Yeah, because we're all believers here today. If you're here today and you're a believer in Jesus Christ, then this message spoke to you. This altar is open for you. We'll leave it wide open. You can come and deal with your God on your own. Please uh, be mindful of the six foot distance. If you want someone to talk with, if you want someone uh, to ask them a question or pray with them, raise your hand. We'll send a counselor with you back to the prayer room where you can maintain your six foot distance as well. We're here to equip the body. Our job here at Shining Light is to make you walk stronger when you leave than when it was when you came. A lot of prayer went into this sermon on our road. Because this sort of kicks society a little bit in the teeth. Wow. Thank yous and praises and pats on the back. But it needs to be known if you're a child of God, a disciple of Jesus Christ, who has equipped you with the power through the Holy Spirit that lives within you, your job is to serve your master. That's it. That's the bottom line. You don't look for praise. You don't look for slaps on the back. This knowledge will grow your walk if you didn't have it before. I pray that you will study on this message. That you'll take it home and that you'll put it in your quiet time. If need be, if you struggle with these things. We're all human. We all get discouraged. We all struggle. There is not a super Christian, at least I haven't met one, and that includes myself. We all have human thoughts. But understand, know your role and what your responsibilities are. All right, let me look up. Or be if you want to lead us. If you need someone, if you need someone,